Good evening. Thank you for joining us at Macaulay Authors um, Entrepreneur Series. My name is Charmaine Lidlow, and on behalf of Interim Dean Valdez, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, tonight, Natalia Sandor will be our featured speaker. She's from the class of 2020, the College of Staten Island. But before I introduce them both, I would like to just say a little of um, what Chancellor Matos wrote about the crisis in Ukraine. Though the crisis may feel remote, the impact is palpable, palpable for many in New York, which is home to the largest Ukrainian community in the nation. For CUNY, an institution that historically welcomed and educated members of, of our immigrant groups from every corner of the world, there is no conflict anywhere in the world that, member, that fails to touch someone, some in our community. Our hearts and prayers are with the Ukrainian people and with CUNY students, faculty, and staff who are personally impacted by the devastating and revolting aggression. Thank you for allowing me to say those words from Chancellor Matos. Now, with Macaulay Honors College, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary, and we are happy that we can curate programming that showcase our alumni and what they are accomplishing in the world and in their community. We would like, also like to connect them with our current students who are the next generation of entrepreneurs. Right now, I would like to introduce our guest. Natalia Sandor is an unconventional, unconventional, an ice cream enthusiast, and a creative with a love for slam poetry. Natalia earned her Bachelor of Science in Business Management in 2020 from Macaulay College of Staten Island campus. Post-graduation, Natalia submerged herself in startup culture as a proud owner and founder of Sandbars Handcrafted, an ice cream sandwich company based in New York. In 2020, Natalia began working as a business developer for ERMOS and co-founded NDR Research, which invests in small businesses um, development ideation. More recently, Natalia started a part-time position at the College of Staten Island as a Blackstone Launchpad Coordinator. It is here where she helps students, student entrepreneurs find resources they need to propel their businesses. Moderating tonight is Saida Tabasam, and is, um, Saida is originally from Bangladesh and a proud Queens resident. She is a Macaulay Honor student at Brooklyn College, of 2024, pursuing an interdisciplinary major combining computer science, ethics, and urban studies. With her experience in computer science, she has interned at American Express, Girls Who Code, and Barclays. This summer, she's excited to be returning as a software engineer intern at American Express. I would like to welcome them both at Macaulay Entrepreneurs. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Charmaine. I'm really excited to be starting this off, especially because it's Women's History Month. Um, and yeah, we have two great women here who are ready to tell you all about our journey being in tech and also starting our own businesses. So Natalia, for those of us who are not familiar with your company, Sandbars, can you give us the story of how you came up with the idea, especially like what inspired you? Yes, 100%. Um, so basically how I got started with Sandbars um, comes from both my parents, actually. They're both entrepreneurs. So it's really like was kind of just part of my path, like watching them growing up. Um, and then that in combination with my extreme love for ice cream um, and a really awesome cookie recipe that I had since I was younger um, kind of was the beginning of Sandbar. So some of the ideation of that happened in my dorm room when I was in freshman year of college at CSI. So it happened in the spring when I was a little bit less busy and I just wanted to keep myself <laughs> more busy and, and put something on, you know, my plate that was a little bit different than an everyone else and create my own opportunity that would kind of differentiate myself from other people um, and give me good uh, experience to talk about one day or uh, learn from and build on. So that's kind of how I started Sandbars. But I guess um, we can share my screen show so I could kind of show everybody what I'm talking about, th these love for ice cream and, and cookies um, and, and what that sort of looks like. Here we go. 
So basically it is a chocolate chip cookie on the outside and then different local ice cream on the inside. Um, and our mission is really to produce high quality goods um, and service uh, different areas of Long Island right now. Um, I currently sell direct to retail and I service about 20 different locations across the island. Um, so we sell mainly wholesale and small batches and really focus on the quality of, of the product. So here's a look. <laughs> oh my God, I'm like craving ice cream now. <laughs> like, um, that looks great. Um, so you mentioned how you came up with this idea in your dorm room. How did you like balance both school and like doing internships, starting your own business? Like, what was that like for you? Sure. Um, and I definitely want to pass this question back to you on um, all the things that you do. But um, yeah, for me, I think a lot of the balance just came with like budgeting my time the right way. Right. So I was a um, athlete in college as well. And I also participated in like six different internships throughout my college career. Um, I also had like a part time job at like the local, uh, not the local, but the uh, on campus at the uh, Department of um, Economic Development. So there was a lot happening all at once, but it's really just uh, you planning your time and blocking your time the right ways. Um, make sure that you can get your work done, um, block out times to do your homework, um, block out times to work out or to, you know, participate in soccer events. But when I was getting started with my business, it was during the spring season. Um, so it's a little bit slower for soccer and it was easy for me to get started. And then my business is, um, especially in the beginning, was a seasonal operation. So it was pretty easy for it to be balanced pretty well between, you know, me going hardcore in the summer and spending a lot of my hours there during the summer and working on it then but also, you know, kind of, I had to pick and choose my battles, you know? So sometimes like I would have to end my season really early with sandbars. Um, like I would stop before Labor Day because um, I would have doubles for soccer that started and I pick and chose, you know, like I was like, all right, like I have to, I don't want to get kicked off the team. So I'm going to go and show up there. So it's a lot of give and take and you have to make the decisions um, based on your priorities at those moments in time. So for me, my priority wasn't that, but sometimes I would go late to soccer and I would miss the first few days of doubles because there was a really big order for sandbars. So a lot of the times it's juggling the hard decisions and making sure that you're doing the best thing for yourself at that moment um, or what you just think is right. And you live and you learn and you figure out, wow, that was a terrible decision. I should have went and played soccer. This wasn't even worth it. Or, you know, things, things happen that you're not prepared for. So um, you can't always look at everything, but you got to just sometimes take the, take the risk and figure it out. Um, how about you? What, so tell, tell us a little bit more about what you're studying and what you, what you're up to and what you do. So we get a yeah. placement of where you're in, you know? Yeah, I, de I definitely hear the whole like prioritizing thing. Cause I feel like that's something I struggle with. So I'm doing like this interdisciplinary major with CUNY BA. I'm doing like computer science, ethics, and urban studies. Um, it's like you create your own major, basically. And it's a really cool program. Um, and so I'm actually like doing an internship with um, American Express. But aside from that, I do do some like nonprofit work as well. I feel like I come from this like art background and I'm like trying to merge it with my computer science like stuff. So I'm always interested in like finding opportunities both with like art and tech. And a lot of the times it's like a lot on my plate, but I feel like um once you do these opportunities you kind of like meet a lot of these people who are gonna like show you other opportunities like they open the doors um and I think that's the most valuable thing you get out of like doing internships because like that's not something you can get from school alone you know like your coursework sure and, like like being able to apply it outside of these internships are like so valuable so I think for me that's like where I'm at but like it's obviously like the learning curves because sometimes I feel like really burnt out like you said, like, you know, I should have just not done this thing, I sure. should have, you know, like there's always that. Um, and but I know you'd be surprised like how uh, tied everything is, right? All your experiences, right? So like I had internships in, you know, construction, I've had them in tech, right? So I was a part of some of the same programming that you were, um, but it was just called something different when I was in school. But um so I was involved in like AR, VR stuff. I was working on, you know, like random things, right? right. Like at one point I was 
working on like certificates of insurance for like a construction company. So, but it all like builds on top of each other and you pick and choose what you liked in each experience and you start finding what your place in is in all of those things, okay. right? So like, oh, I really liked the pitching of this or I like being a leader in this. And maybe I did like the coding or I like the art mm-hmm. stuff and art is actually very similar to coding and right. people wouldn't think that, but the logic sometimes is very similar between like for me, it wasn't art, it was English, but English and writing and poetry is sometimes very similar to coding and like what is happening in, you know, C++ or something. Like right. That. And I, I think you also learn like what you don't like. I think that might be more valuable too, because you're like, all right, I did this thing, but I kind of didn't like it. So now, you know, in the future, like what you look for um, when you're looking for like a job. Um, and I know you mentioned like you did all this computer science stuff in the beginning. And I think you told me like you initially started out as a computer science major is that right um yeah there was like two more before that (laughs) (laughs) I was in engineering to start and then I yeah I switched over to comp sci and then I was in information systems and then back over to comp sci and then I finished off in business when I was like I had run my business for maybe two and a half years at that point and it was still going and I was like I really need to learn how to deal with this so I switched Mm -hmm. over to business management like I think it was my junior year, my second semester or something like that, like something crazy. Like I jammed all my business credits into like the last three semesters of my college career. Whereas like the whole rest of my college was, you know, obviously the general classes that you take in the beginning, I had Macaulay things that I had to take care of. But um, yeah, for the most part, I was in the the comp sci kind of section of everything. (laughs) Yeah. So do you still feel like some of that stuff you learned in comp sci, like is still applied to like what you do, like with entrepreneurship? Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think the logic is, is very similar to, you know, the way that say like a WordPress or Squarespace works. Um, so like when you're building a website for your small business, like mm. the logic that's used in comp sci is very applicable to something like that, or um, the way that things could be structured or the logic applied to even like financial documents or, you know, the way that Um, kind of databases could be or data and information are stored and how they could be tied and understood together all of that kind of thinking is like business but very 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 much tech as well you know Um, in combination with if you're better at like understanding how computers process things how they save things all of that stuff like that helps so you don't get frustrated with your computer when it's not acting the way that you want it to, you know? Um, I think that's like, honestly, a big lesson that CompSci t- taught me is to just like be more patient with technology and think about the way that people coded it in the first place, you know? Right, right. Um, so when you were first starting out, were, was it just like you? Did you like um, network with other people? Did you have mentors? Like, how was it in the beginning for you? Sure. Um, So I think in the beginning, like it's definitely it was a combination between like friends and family. Right. Mm -hmm. So my aunt is the person that came up with the name of the business. And I originally like did not like the name at all. (laughs) Um, But then it like it grew on me. It's a great name and has like three different meanings and it's fit. It fits perfectly. But, um, yeah, no, in the beginning, it was definitely like a majority of the work was done by like me, my parents and my family my family members recruiting them to come and help me. Um, But I had launched a Kickstarter um, my first summer and got fully funded. So I got a little bit of money from that, um, like $2,500, I think it was. So it was a little bit, um, but it it got me started with a, you know, a freezer and like um, stickers or whatever I needed, magnet, um, just investment in raw materials. So supplies for the cookies, the ice cream that I need to purchase and all of that stuff. And then from there, I got into my first location, um, like later on that summer. But yeah, I think the initial like people that helped me out were really like the ice cream people that I was associating with. And then um, and my dad made a lot of those connections for me. Like he he knows a few people in the food industry. So I think um, I was introduced to a mentor who kind of held my hand in the beginning for a long time. She gave me her bag, she gave me molds, she gave me, she showed me how to cut things, she showed me how to work in the kitchen and things like that, so she was, I think, I don't want to, like, 
date her the wrong um, age, but she was definitely in her like late seventies. And she was like, knew everything because she had run a, um, she had run a uh, granola bar company. So the size of my bar is actually based on a granola bar. That, that was a company run by um, this woman, Grace, who just helped me out so much in the beginning. Um, but yeah, since then, there's probably like been a thousand people that have helped this continue to grow and move along. Um, so it's by all means, I am a sole owner, but I do not do any of this by myself at all. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is so impressive because like you're like just out of college, right? You've recently graduated and like you're running your own business. I think that's just so impressive. Um, but like along with that, I know um, you definitely had to face some obstacles, right? Um, especially because I feel like maybe this is like a male dominated industry or even you might be the youngest in the room. So like, how do you navigate those situations? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, like, for me, I think, um, like, communicating is the hardest part, <laughs> because you don't want to, like, come across too aggressive, or you don't want to be too weak, or you don't want to say things too soon, or say things too late, or say it the wrong way, or use the wrong form, like, the wrong channel of communication, like, do I text this person, do I call them, do I show up in person, like, so I think even like technology plays a weird role in, in some of that as well, of like being a barrier of like um, people being the most upfront and honest about like um, confrontational conversations that inevitably happen within business, right? Um, those are like, those are the moments when like some of those things shine for me, like me being a, a girl or me being younger, um, like those insecurities about um, being not even like, it's not even um, anything besides like my own like mental kind of like insecurity about being like not knowledgeable enough to to know what I'm talking about in a situation mm -hmm. or something like that, right? And I think some of that also just comes from a lot of the times when you're dealing with someone who's been in the industry for like 35 years and I've only been in business for five it, it just becomes like this, like scary, like, oh, how do I, what's the right way to talk to them? Um, but I think like overcoming some of that is definitely leaning on the other people getting advice for like, how should I communicate this? Or, um, you know, what should I be saying? Here's what I'm trying to articulate. And, you know, how can I, I don't want to say get what you want, but like a lot of the times it's like, you need to understand your best outcome from a situation and be able to figure out the right ways to communicate those things. Um, right. Yeah, so I think I, I, I think there's something to be said about like you recently figuring this out because I feel like there's knowledge in that, like figuring out like the newest trends, like the marketing and the Instagram stuff. Like you probably have more knowledge in that, you know, because like we're just younger, so we know all of this tech stuff. So I think that that gets like undervalued sometimes. Yeah, no, definitely. Agreed. But like it's this weird balance of like sometimes the industry, like that I'm in particularly like, and a lot of them are um, like kind of stay true to some old, like right. they're not very good at changing a lot of the times, right? Um, like construction's a really good example of that. But I think like in food and some, just some of the restaurant industry is so <laughs> like tough to, to navigate sometimes. But I think like sometimes uh, people that are running certain shops or um, whatnot that have been doing it a long time, like they're set in some in different types of ways um, that you also just have to adapt to as well um, and just get used to that. But yeah, I think it, it's definitely, that's the communication for me, at least more recently. That's why that's my like initial answer to that um, is like the hardest thing. Yeah, de definitely like because of COVID as well, like you're not doing like face-to-face -face things. So like, yeah. <laughs> Schedule, yeah. Um, so we have a Q and A question in the chat from Hillary, and she asked a question that I was also going to ask. So um, she asks, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently when you were first starting out? Um, honestly, no, because like every for me, like every summer feels like a new start. So like if you did something that you regretted, or you did something that you were like, oh my God, like, and learn from it, right? Um, I think you can implement those things when you go again, um, when you get started, whatever, like quarter, whatever week, whatever month you're talking about, like there's always 
there's always time um, to, to make that kind of change and, and pursue that moving forward. So I think for me, um, yeah, looking back on it, there's been times that like I've wanted to close down my business or walk away from it or things got really hard or there's been situations that I would have loved to avoided. Like I, I had made a, a pretty silly um, legal mistake um, my second year in business. And that was like really that hung over my head for like a long, much longer than it should have. Um, and I think like avoiding that would have made my life a ton easier. But at the same time, like there was so many lessons that I learned within that um, about like protecting myself and um, doing my due diligence and speaking to lawyers or just covering myself when, you know, I'm even in the middle of talking to somebody. Like sometimes you just don't think to have people sign a contract or have people sign a non-disclosure or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so I think I would have never learned that lesson if I didn't go through um, that. So I would say, obviously, I, I wish I did that differently, but on the same token, um, if I did that differently, I wouldn't know as much as I do about the, the topic. And I think for me, the core of all of this was always to be educated on business and to learn about what it means to run a startup. So for me, that's, me reaching my goal is to understand more and to develop myself as, you know, a young professional than it was for me to like have this accelerating, like awesome business. That's like, you know, killing it, which is obviously the goal as well. But I think it's, it's, um, I guess the humbling thing about that is that that takes a lot longer than everyone thinks. So, um, and it takes a lot more money than everyone thinks. So a lot of the times things require, a lot of investment, unless it's like something like overnight, like tech, like a crazy innovation. Like what I'm, I'm pursuing here as a business is a brand. Um, and it, it requires a lot of time and it's a very inventory heavy business. So it's just, um, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to get like that overnight, like quick kind of thing. Um, like a, a startup like mine takes about like 10 to 15 years to really um, be like, say at like a national level or something like that. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's so powerful. Like that's such a powerful mindset to have, like not taking like failures as like completely like trying to shut down, like, um, you kind of live and you learn. Right. I think that's like true for anything. Like even when it comes to like not getting like an internship, like, especially for me, I feel like when you don't get something you want, you kind of like, you're kind of hard on yourself. Like if you're someone like me, um, right. But then again, like opportunities come like when they're like most unexpected. Um, yeah. And so, I feel like they also just come at times when you need them the most too, right? right. So I think like for me, um, it kind of like, it shows you when you can actually like be humbled and just be patient for the next thing. And when you're like looking, always looking for something new, always looking for something new to then just like step back and be like, okay, no, like let me actually deal with what I have on my plate now make that great and then embrace whatever comes when I'm doing my best at what I have on my plate, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, for you, do you feel like, um, when it comes to like competition or things like that, like, do you feel like you compare yourself a lot to other brands or like, how do you deal with that? Sure. Um, honestly, not really. I think like, um, I, I think I'm my biggest competition, so I'm not really, invested in in looking at other brands because I think if I love my product then it's a great product but I think like there's it's really hard to make me love my product because like some years you have to every year my product changes it's just the way it is when you're scaling when you're growing when you're taking on like different steps in the way that you're pursuing your production or the way that you've decided to test out a new packaging or something like that like things just happen where you're trying new things and you want to see what if your business tries this hat on what it looks like for them versus this one and sometimes those decisions like even though that it's a hard pill to sw swallow at times sometimes those decisions last a few months instead of like just a day you know so sometimes when you make that jump you got to stick with it and ride it out and really evaluate how it was doing how it did after x amount of time and if the decision was a bad one, you look at that and you're like, oh my God, that was like a painful three months that I had to like, you know, like go through that inventory of stuff or whatever, you know, you invested in. Um, and other times it, it pays off and it's like, oh my God, that was a great step for me. But um, so I'm kind of just giving like overarching 
comments about this, but I can go into more detail. Um, more specifically, like the, this past year, I had I got into manufacturing facilities. Um, so two of them, one for ice cream, one for cookies. And my cookie recipe just changed a ton because it was on such a larger scale. Like the mixer was like the size of my room. Like the, it was on like conveyor belts and like being dished out and baked at like, you know, 80 trays at a time, 10,000 cookies at a time. And like, it was a great step for me because the year prior I was running a 11 or 12 person kitchen. And that was, had its own stresses that were not good for me either. So there's kind of like, for me, after that summer that I was running the 12 people in the kitchen, I was like, okay, great experience. This was a great summer. My product, my product was okay that year. Um, the ice cream had a little bit of an issue that year. Um, but I was like, I, it's too limiting for me working in my business every day and never getting a chance to work on my business. So I need to get myself out of a production position because I know myself I don't want to be a kitchen manager I don't want to just like I love baking I love the kitchen I'm Italian I'm born and raised in the kitchen I love food um, obviously I started a food business I'm super into it but at the same time like I had started this business to be a business owner not to be a baker right it wasn't like oh this is my passion I'm just gonna hang out in the bakery all day like no I my goal was to make this a growth startup and to be in potentially in Whole Foods and across the US and X, Y, and Z, right? So my main goal for the year after that was to get out of the kitchen position and to move on to having it produced by someone else so that I could focus on the business side of things and understand financial stuff better, legal stuff better, uh, sales and marketing. Those were the hats that I really wanted to test out, um, but I was getting caught up in the kitchen. So that step for me was necessary for like me wanting to continue to move my business. But I, you know, choosing a co-manufacturer and choosing like where you're going to get your product produced is not an easy thing to do, right? You have to teach someone your recipe. You have to make sure that they can scale it up the right way. You need to make sure that it fits your cost. You need to make sure that, um, you know, the ice cream tastes good, like on a larger scale. So there's a lot, there was a lot of like issues that arose in terms of the quality of my product uh, last summer. So now I'm reevaluating again and rethinking again. So it's kind of like this never ending cycle of being your own competition. Um, but at the same time, like you have to pay attention to your competitors to understand what makes you different and where your value proposition lies um, or else you got yourself in a whole other category where you're only producing something for yourself instead of understanding your entire market and understanding that there's a diverse group of people that need to be consuming your product and liking your product. Um, but in the beginning, you know, there's internal problems that you have to overcome first, I think, before like, you know, hitting the competition at a larger scale. Yeah, I think you just answered um, Yasmin's question in the Q&A, which she was asking about, like, um, how did you find manufacturers or source the materials? And then if you weren't, if it weren't for like a mentor, how would you go about it? Because I know you mentioned you had that person in the beginning who like had the materials. Yeah. Um. So like finding a manufacturer is a whole other like ball game. It's like dating. You have to like actually research a thousand different places and contact them and go mm. to their facility, make sure it's clean, taste the product, get pricing from them and have all those like confrontational conversations that I was telling you about like they're not easy conversations like because you're building a relationship with someone over months and months and months and or a, a month or two and they're giving you samples and it's perspective business with you and then you have to tell them no or you have to tell them maybe but can you lower your price and you know it's like negotiating skills that sometimes they don't like I got into my business classes later on in college, but sometimes they don't teach you that kind of stuff in school, right? Um, so it is like a, a bit of a challenge to find the right partners for you. And again, I'm still in, I'm still looking and you should always be looking. It's it's good practice to have two co-packers um, instead of one, uh, just because like supply chain stuff that's been happening, especially with COVID uh, labor issues. Um, it also like, it's just good practice in terms of like a kind of like a uh, insurance to yourself. If like a facility um, 
burnt down or something like that, or there was like a, a something that unpredictable, like they had to cut your product line um, immediately and they, you know, kicked you out for some reason, it's always good to have a backup um, just in case. So um, I think, I don't know if that answered the question, but it's a, it's definitely a, a long search where you have to, you have to kind of interview a lot of different people and figure out what's a good fit for you. Cause it's a, it's a two-way relationship, right? Like both parties need to be making money. Both parties need to enjoy the relationship. Both parties need to have good communication. So it's not like you can just walk into a shop and like make it happen the next day. Um, like it's definitely, it takes time to build a good relationship. Um, in terms of sourcing materials and stuff, um, there's like places where you can buy physical uh, products. So you would just have to find um, those kind of shops. You can find it online. You could find it, you know, there's like restaurant depot and stuff like that. If you're talking specifically about like food goods, um, but sourcing materials is also another crazy like <laughs> rabbit hole that you have to find the right um, raw material supplier as well. Like there's different options and there's people that work for you, um, whether that be price-wise, location-wise, um, all that stuff. So it is um, more in-depth than what meets the eye, for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like that answered the question. And I just want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A option, ask all the questions you want. <laughs> um, one question I had was, um, do you feel like if somebody were to offer to buy your business or like buy your brand, would you be willing to do that or do you feel like you would want to like own it yourself like for the entirety of its lifetime you know yeah I mean so a lot of the like advice or just like the the way of the kind of like world <laughs> in mm -hmm. entrepreneurship is that you should feel this way about your business you should want to run it until the day you die like it you should have the passion to like run it forever and run it until you know you pass it on to whoever else is going to take it from you um but you should also be ready to sell tomorrow so you should be building your business to get it to a point that it looks nice to sell so if i build my business to a point that it looks nice to sell then it's a great place for me too, because then I'd want to buy it, you know, as well. But also it, it puts you in a good position to leverage that like interest in your business. Um, because you've got your sales to a point, you got your profit margin to a point that looks appealing to people and they want to buy it from you outright, or your competition wants to squash you. So you must have something going um that the competition wants to buy you out and shut your business down. So um I think it's kind of a mix of both, right? Like, um, is my answer to that. Um, because you should, again, you should have the passion to like, yeah, I, I want to run this. I want, I could see myself running this and being the CEO of a group of 40 people with a, you know, a headquarters somewhere. Um, but at the same time, if someone approached me with the right number tomorrow and they're valuing my company at something that makes sense and it, it works for me to propel me into the, whatever is next for me in my journey as an individual, then I have to be realistic about that and make a good personal decision as well. So I think um, it depends on the number. <laughs> <laughs> that is so smart. Like you go to Shark Tank, you pitch your idea. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just want to stop a little bit here. If anyone has any Q&A questions, if not, we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me, let me ask you a question. So, um, wait, you mentioned that you have your own business as well. Did I hear that right or no? No, no, I'm not as impressive as you. <laughs> no, that's not even close, not even close. All right. So what is your interest? Why are you interested in entrepreneurship and how do you like, even just what we've spoken about, like so far, how do you feel like it's it's crossed over with some of your experiences, say in like technology or in college? Yeah, I feel like I've always had this like mindset of like creating something of my own, um, which sounds kind of selfish, but no, I just feel like um, I want to make an impact that's bigger than me. And for me, I feel like entrepreneurship is like the the right path for that. I feel like you have so much control of, of the decisions. You're, you're You're like your own boss. I feel like that's like something I really want, <laughs> like in the long term future. Um, so when it comes to me, like I want to like make this mark about like 
cybersecurity, like getting people's information secure. Um, so like starting a tech startup on something like that is like interesting for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, we, we have a question in the chat. Um, so Bernadine asks, can you define what social entrepreneurship means to you? Sure. Um, so I like, I love to take a crazy approach to this because um, I think it's more in depth than like just people being committed to a, like a cause or something like that, or them being committed to helping out the environment or trying to keep that consistent throughout their processes and production and things like that. But for me, like sustainability really has to deal with like economics, social and environment. So if those three things are moving at the same rate, then things are more sustainable. Um, so I think like part of me being a social entrepreneur um, is really about including those three things along the way, right? Because you can't really be impactful unless you have some money to back you up because people don't pay attention to things that aren't making money that makes people want to pay attention, right? So I think there's a certain level of it that I want to make this a like something that obviously can keep going has an economic impact, right? Um, so that being like, how many people am I employing? Um, how many jobs am I hosting in my business? All of that kind of stuff, but also like what, how much profit I have at my dispense to do amazing things with, right? To give back with um, and to create differences in categories that I care about, right? So women's rights and things like that or equality. Um, and then at the same time, it's about considering the environment, right? So how much are my plants doing or what, um, you know, what's my driving like in terms of like logistics distribution, um, you know, any outputs in terms of like footprint and things like that, paying attention to those numbers and understanding and evaluating how to make that better. And those are things I, I don't even know yet, right? Because I don't really understand um, that that part of it yet, but I know as a person I'm committed to these types of things, so I'm going to be paying attention to that if I do end up being the brand that I want to be, right? Um, so I think it, it, it does start from the top, right? So if someone is an, a social entrepreneur, um, then the way that they build their business will be that way as well. And they'll kind of teach the people that they're able to take underneath their wing, the same kind of thing. Um, and then the other part of it is the, the social part of it as well. So for me, a, a lot of the work that I currently do has to, um, I like to include other people in on it as well. So I have internship programs. Um, and so far I've probably hosted around 25 different student interns um, because for me education is a really big part of why I run Sandbars. It was the whole reason why I started in the first place, right? Because I was trying to learn about business and understand all of this. So I want to like pass that along to other people as well. So um, I've probably had about 10 or 15 um, uh, BMCC students work for me. Um, and then I've had a kind of a varying group of other <laughs> other students work for me for from like uh, Binghamton to NYU to CSI Macaulay um, to some some people out here on the island at a it's called BOCES which is a high school they actually have taken pictures for me um, it was a photography class which is awesome um, so I go in I give them presentations on business and uh, teach them how you know their help with the photography stuff might impact my my business and uh, they are able to learn a little bit and I'm able to also be a client for them, but also not be so serious, right? So I could say like, oh, I like this picture, but you know, can you edit this, this and that? And for me, it's just, you know, it's good to have content um, and for them, it's good to learn a little bit. So that social aspect of it too, is I really care about building out um, something that's going to enhance the lives and education of other people. Yeah, I think that's something I'm very interested in, in as well. Um, we have this question in the chat, which I was also going to ask is like, we want to hear more about um, your Blackstone initiative that you have at CSI, I think. Sure. Or, yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So Blackstone. Um, so I guess I'll hop into like, I do other things on top of sandbars because sandbars is going to take time to grow. Right. And I'm my own person that needs to accelerate my life as well. So I have a part-time job at uh, CSI um, 
where I am the program coordinator at Blackstone. And Blackstone, basically, um, if you guys haven't heard of the private equity firm, they're one of the, if not the largest in the world. Um, they gave a bunch of money to um, a bunch of different schools. There's like 46 universities involved. Um, and they basically um, supply them with like um, grants, grant money to execute programming for entrepreneurship within these universities. Um, so we were the lucky one of them. Um, and just like a few other CUNY schools as well um, that got some funding back in 2021. Um, I think uh, BMCC, City College, Baruch, um, Lehman, uh, they're all part of it as well. Um, but basically what we do is we help students um, get the support and access they need to entrepreneurial thinking, the mindset behind it, um, curriculum, right? Um, and also just other programming and support that they might need. So competitions and um, some money to help kickstart um, your business if you apply to the competitions and you won. So we've got awards. Um, there's a lot of different programming for like internships, fellowships, um, things like that, scholarships. Um, but it's all to push entrepreneurship and people starting their own thing. Or if not, like, it's more of just teaching that mindset of like, succeeding and failing or um, taking a risk or being confident, um, those kind of things, pitching, they're all really great experiences. So like nine out of 10 businesses don't work out, right? So sandbars might fail tomorrow, but everything that I've built up to this point is amazing experience for me and knowledge for me that I'm always gonna use in the future, right? So I think like a lot of the times that when you create your own opportunity, you could do it on the side as a little side hustle, or it could be your main focus for a little while. Um, but I think like those types of things makes you different on a resume, makes you really like um, just look good for if you want to uh, get an interview and go be a part of a nine to five or something like that. But it also prepares you if you do want to run your own business as well. So it's a good opportunity for people to kind of explore themselves. Um, check out a few different, uh, try on a few different hats. Like, do I like the financial side of this or do I like the marketing side of this or do I like the, you know, whatever other side, <laughs> the uh, business operation side of it, right? Um, and if you're able to answer that question, you can start learning more about where you fit in it, potentially into the overall economy, right? Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. It really, um, the, the launch pad is really to help people do that. Um, low risk kind of help them get started with figuring that stuff out. And again, like even if they just take their curriculum and they never start their own business, they learn something that they can use if they were a head nurse or if they were to move on and go um, be a part of the electrical unit or uh, union or something like that. Like I think, and obviously tech is so intertwined with entrepreneurial thinking because design thinking, user-centered design, human-centered design, they're all up the same alley, alley. like empathy mapping, all of that stuff crosses mm -hmm. over, you know, data collection, uh, surveying, interviewing, understanding consumers, customers, all of that. Um, you can't design things for people that you don't understand, right? So I think um, a lot of that definitely crosses over with CS. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think- uh, that's, that's kind of the reason I'm doing this like interdisciplinary major where it's like combining, like learning about like ethics and like social justice. Like, you know, you kind of have to know the issues that matter and then like sure. apply and then use your technical skills to um, make it better. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so like, I'm so impressed with the art stuff too, because <laughs> art, art is so important, right? Like think about the crazy stuff that's happening inside of like the metaverse right now, like yeah. how much is, is associated with graphic design and art, right? Um, and also just like that, pro those processes of like being creative and, and drawing or, or whatever your interests are, um, yeah. how it's associated with the free thinking that has to come with like when you're challenged with a hard problem in computer science or when you have to kind of think about things differently how can I sort this quicker or x y and z yeah yeah you said it better than I could have um one one thing I'm wondering is like for these like Blackstone launch pads or like say like Whitney or the breakthrough tech program like how did you find out about that like where should people look I mean you probably have some insight about this being like a program coordinator like is it like through newsletters like where do sure. people go to find out yeah, I mean, like, I think that's honestly the greatest attribute I have as an entrepreneur is just being resourceful, right? Like, I am literally the most resourceful person. I'm looking, I'm always like, 
I think sometimes people are just like, oh, I don't want to attend this webinar because it's like, I don't know, at six o'clock and uh, I have my midterms, right? <laughs> um, or um, X, Y, and Z, right? Like there's always reasons to skip out on things and, you know, we're meant to skip things we're meant to skip. But I think in general, like if you pay attention to the stupid emails that you usually delete, or if you check out a board that you walk past every day at your school, or you actually stop and take a minute to pay attention to the crazy amount of information we're bombarded with every single day. Sometimes there's really good stuff in there. Um, and a lot of the times you have to pay attention to people that you trust and actually open your ears and listen to what they have to say. So if someone's recommending that you check this out or you look into this career or you look into that, you should really you know, listen to it and check it out for a minute and see if it, it's up your alley or not. Um, but for me, it was just trying a lot of different things and being open-minded and saying yes a bunch of times to random things that like, you know, sometimes you show up and you're like, well, that was really weird. <laughs> and then like other times you show up and you're like, wow, those were my people. Like I really fit in like that. That was an awesome experience for me. And then you continue to try to seek out similar experiences to that emulate that same kind of energy um, that you liked from the first thing. Um, so I would just say like, pay attention to things because um, they do fall in your lap more often than you think that they do. You're just not paying attention. Right. Um, but also yeah. you have to seek it out, right? Like if you're interested and curious about something, reach out to people. Like um, I always say when I'm speaking to people, like send me an email after this or, you know, X, Y, and Z to, to continue to chat with people um, or me and you, right? If you got a kick out of, um, you know, connecting with me, like stay connected with me, add me on LinkedIn, uh, send me an email in a month from now and check in. So sometimes like you feel like you're being pushy, but it's good to stay connected to people because people are the reason why we're, we're, we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And I feel like even like the Macaulay newsletters, like they have like so many opportunities at the bottom, the career handshake, which we have at um, Macaulay, like there's so many resources out there. You just kind of have to like, look, um, I want to get to this question in the Q and A. So do you have any insight on how to start up um, as an entrepreneur and how we wait, do you have any insight on how a startup entrepreneur can slowly pursue their dream, but also keep their day job? Uh, do you agree with the age old saying, I'd rather work 16 hours for myself instead of eight hours for somebody else? Is there a happy medium um, so we don't have to work all day, every day to survive as a small business? Um, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you have to just pull the risk and quit your day job if it's getting that out of hand. But I think you also just build it slowly. Um, I think like they said, so slowly pursue the dream in that same motion. So if you have a day job and you have, you get to do, you know, you want to do an hour or two after your day job, or you want to work during lunch, or you want to wake up early, or you want to do a little bit of work on the weekend, um, then you can get a few hours in a week that's going to move your business forward. But I think that kind of goes back to some of the time management stuff that I was talking about in the beginning and budgeting the right way. So if you have, obviously, if you have a full-time job and you're a parent and you've got kids at home, like I'm, I can't really give advice about that because I don't have kids and I'm not a parent, but I think like it's, it goes back to like, if you really want to do something, you'll make time for it. Um, no matter what, no matter what it is. Um, and you kind of have to prioritize it. So if you, have this as a priority, then maybe you don't go out on a Friday night, you stay in and you work on your ice cream business until two in the morning and ice cream melts all over the place and you got to <laughs> clean it up at three in the morning and got to be up at five for something else, you know, like it, it happens. So sometimes like, again, it goes back to whatever you prioritize. So if the business is something you really want to pursue and pri prioritize as your number two after your day job, then make it your number two. Um, if it's your number three, then make it your number three. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that would be my advice is to just pursue it slowly. And then when, once it gets to a point where it could support you the way that your nine to five does, mm -hmm. um, then quit your nine to five if that's what you want to pursue. Some really good advice. Um, Brianne asks, is there any part of your, um, any part of owning your own business that you don't like? Um, yeah, of course definitely. <laughs> um, I think like, it's definitely really hard to work a lot of hours a week and actually put in money into something instead of get paid. Right. So I think like, you just have to put into perspective of like, 
this is an investment in myself. And if it fails tomorrow, like I just have to embrace that this all was an investment in myself and my education. But if it like you invest in yourself and it pays off, um, then all of this time will be paid back to you in the future, right? Um, but I also don't like thinking about it that way either because I'm already reaping benefits of the knowledge that I've gained over the past five years. So it's not like I'm not getting paid. Um, it's just a different type of payment that sometimes gets really frustrating in your day to day when you're like, so many people don't work like half as hard as I do. And like, like, why am I wasting my time doing this? But it's just more of like, you have to be your own, per like the person that answers that question back. Like, why am I doing this? Okay, let me remind myself why I'm doing this and kind of like answer that to yourself. But I think other times the universe answers that. Like if, if I have a really bad week, there'll be like something that happens during my day that will remind me why I'm still doing this. So it's like kind of a sign from the universe that keep going, like, it's okay. I know it's a rough one today, but um, like someone will message me, this is the best ice cream I've ever had in my life or whatever. So I think like those little moments, like you have to like really hold on to the the good things that happen because stuff is really hard. Like um, you miss your doubles in soccer to, to go make this delivery and then the you drop a bunch of bars off and they forgot to put it in the freezer and they all melt so like it's just like things things happen that you can't account for um and it it's difficult so um yeah i would say there's a that that kind of jumps out as the the one thing i don't like <laughs> currently because i feel like i should be a billionaire for how much work i put in but um i think i'm a billionaire in other ways so it's fine <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I think it takes a certain amount of like resilience and I definitely feel like you have that, like just hearing you speak about it. Um, Charmaine in the chat asks, um, with all the changes in your major in the beginning, like how valuable was your advisor in your college career? Sure. Um, for me, pretty valuable. Like they, so at Macaulay, they do a really good job of um, being on top of the way that you're um, processing information and stuff like that. But I think my advisors at one point, like they were like, how did you even like do this again and make this happen? Like my one advisor was like, I've never seen so many cha like change their major this much in their life. Like they were just like, just would make fun of me almost like not actually make fun of me but um just like poke fun with me um about how many times I changed my major but throughout all of that yeah like that that lightheartedness of like even just laughing about how many times I changed like that helps when you're like in a complete disaster about like how uncertain you are about what to choose and what path should I go in and I really like comp sci but I like I like being the leader of the, the group, not the coder. Like, what, where do I fit? Like, it's very confusing. And like, I loved English. So I was like, what do I even do with this? Like, there were so many questions all the time. So yeah, my, my uh, career advisor and co uh, college um, advisor um, helped a bunch with like what classes to take and what I should check out. And um, even if they led me on the wrong path and said, hey, try this major out. And I was like, oh my God, I did one week and I hated it or something like that. That helped, right? Um, but they were always, Macaulay was great. They were always there um, to support me and to make sure I wasn't too far off track. I, I think they were like watching me with a close eye. They're like, this girl's like maneuvering a lot, but like it's within the lines that it, she'll still be fine. You know, they, they were making sure I was okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, but I think for me, um, like figuring it all out, it really comes from you. It's, it, you can't really make it come from anywhere else. So it's a tough, it, there's times where it's a tough journey figuring out what you want to do, but it just, every day you're learning and adding on to it and it slow it down sometimes when it feels like it's going too fast. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I know we're kind of reaching the end of this. I want to respect everyone's time, but, uh, kind of to wrap things up. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, what do you think is next for you? Like, do you plan on starting another um, bit small business? Uh, yeah. Maybe pursuing something else? Like, what's next for you? Yeah, well, I'm always, I'm pursuing things all the time. So yeah, it sounds a like it. Yeah, a few different small, like, businesses that I've, I'm involved in at a very small level. Um just like equity and I do some business development in them. So those three little, little guys are hanging out right now and we'll, we'll see what happens with them. Um, 
And then with the, I am enjoying the, the, the position at the college um, because I do really like working with, with the students and coaching them and looking at their pitch decks and stuff like that. So I'm curious to see like where I end up with all of that in, in a year or so, like we'll see what, what happens with all of that if I wanna continue to pursue that or if I'm leaning more towards like a business coaching kind of like interest in my career or not. Um, Cause that's definitely coming up to the surface a little bit more as I do all of these internship programs and stuff like that. Like. I really, I do like coaching people with their business. And I've been taking on a little bit more of like um, business consulting kind of as freelance. I've been doing that a little bit lately where people like are hiring me to come in and check out their processes and tell them what what I think might work better for them or help them with social media and stuff like that if they, they're kind of stuck with their branding. Um, so yeah, like that might morph into me starting my own coaching business, who knows? Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited to see where Sandbars goes. Um, there's always awesome opportunities just like flying into my lap. So if one of them will stick and we'll see what happens or um, I could choose tomorrow that I wanna pursue the coaching and that, that works for me or I wanna go full on with uh, being a professor and teaching entrepreneurship at a university level or something like that. So I think, uh, yeah, I think I don't want to set any boundaries to myself. Right. I think when you put expectations, they become boundaries sometimes. So mm -hmm. no, I, I think you should definitely do the mentorship, like become your own career coach. Cause I feel like I've learned so much, like just in the matter of this hour. Um, and I hope everyone else feels the same. Like I feel like there's so much that I've learned now. Um and thank you. Thank you for all the questions. I appreciate them a bunch and I want to learn more about you. So I'd love to, yeah. they should set up another call and interview you about all the things that you do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Charmaine put your uh, website in the, the chat. So everyone should definitely check it out. And I follow your Instagram now. So I'll awesome. definitely watch the journey, see where <laughs> it goes. Maybe I'll find it at Whole Foods one day. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. 100%. yeah. All right. So I, I think we can close off now um, unless anyone has any other questions. If not, I think they can reach out to you, Natalia. Yeah. Yeah. I, anyone can, I could drop my LinkedIn in the chat. I don't know if uh, people are interested in that or not. Yeah. That would be great, so, Natalia. Thank you everyone for joining us. I think what I've gotten out of this conversation, such a great conversation, such um, great gems too, when you talk about entrepreneurs being, you know, you have to be resourceful mm -hmm. and it's just an investment in you. So just all the valuable lessons that you gave us here today. I wanna thank you so much for your time. And yeah, thank, thank you both, Saida, Natalia, thank you so much for joining us here at, um, at Macaulay at the Entrepreneur Series. And hopefully everyone listening today will join us again at another Entrepreneur Series. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Thanks Have for having me. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.